Hello and welcome back out to the garage where we're sitting next to my uh, massive computer here. Although we've been working pretty hard at stripping as much as we can out of this chassis. And there's really only one large component left to take out of here and that is the computer itself down here on the bottom. And so what I want to do today is I want to pull this whole computer frame out and then take each of the individual cards out and take a look at each of the cards in more detail. So it doesn't look like it should be too difficult to pull out, just a couple screws and then we can get it out onto the bench and take a look at those cards. So let's get into it. All right, so first things first, let's remove these ribbon cables. Even though some of these only go between cards, I think it's gonna make life a little easier when we start pulling out the individual cards. Uh, and so this relatively thin one here goes from the CMD card here to the disk 1-1 card here, and then ultimately over to the CPU card here. So we'll go ahead and uh, unplug those. All right, and then the next uh, rather large cable here goes from disk AUT to disk 1.1. One, one. Um, and so it's actually massive, but I think we can get it out of the way pretty easily. And then just below that one on the disk AUT card here is this huge uh, ribbon cable here. And this is the one that spears off and goes to the Hawk drive. So we'll go ahead and get it out of the way. There we go. And then on the back, plugged directly into the bus board, is this ribbon cable, which actually goes all the way up to the top to the LED display that's sitting at the top of the entire rack. So this is just moving data up to there so we can see what's going on. So let's go ahead and unplug it. All right, I think that's all of the cables. All that's left now is to take out these four screws that hold this whole unit into the rack. All right, it took a bit of work. Uh, these boards were really stuck into that back plane and it was very difficult to pull them out. Uh, but you can see we got them all out and sitting on the table here and that we have nine boards in total. So we have the printer board up here and then we have two multiplexer boards here. Then we have our two drive control boards here, our two memory control boards here, and then our two processing boards over here. Now you'll notice that I said everything is essentially in groups of two, and that's because I believe this is a 16-bit system, but it's kind of designed around an 8-bit methodology. And I think what I mean will become a little clearer once we start taking a look at the boards in individual detail. So let's get into it. Let's take a look at each individual board, and I will of course put high resolution photos of each board front and back in the description below. So we'll start with the least complicated board and then work our way up to the most complicated board. Now, first up is the bus board, which we can see is uh, relatively simple. We can actually see a build date on it up here uh, as the uh, 49th week of 1979, which would lead you to believe that the computer was built in 1979, but some of the other boards have much later dates. So I think that there was a lot of new old stock being used when this computer was built. Uh, now some people in the comments on a previous video had asked if this is an S100 bus and I do not believe it is because uh, these connectors are actually 72 pin connectors. On the far right here we can see what looks like uh, interesting colored integrated circuits but these are actually just resistor packs and I think these are the termination resistors. And then on the left side here we have some uh, glue logic as well as uh, this TI chip right here which is a uh, TBP18S42N, and I believe that this is a 4096-bit uh, programmable read-only memory. On the back side of the bus here is where our power connections are, 
And interestingly, they labeled most of them. So this one is plus 12 here. This one is minus 12 over here. This one is plus five. And then these three in the center here are all electrically connected. And I'm pretty sure those are ground. And I don't see any plus 24 volt on here. So the plus 24 volt rail that's coming off of our power supply may not actually be used by the computer, which I find really interesting. Perhaps the power supply was meant for several different computers and uh, Centurion really only needed three power rails. But that is the bus board. It looks relatively simple. I love these super tiny data lines that are going between and then these super thick power lines that are up top and on the bottom. But it's only meant to connect the cards to each other. So let's start taking a look at those cards. All right, this is the printer interface card. Now it's got a date stamp on it right over here on the bottom right that says 1778, so the 17th week of 1978. But it's a relatively simple looking board. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even have any bespoke ICs on it. Every IC on here is a 7400 series IC. Even these big ones here, this one is a uh, SN 74154 and this one is a 7419. So I'm not entirely sure what kind of interface the printer uses, but apparently it was enough for them to build entirely out of discrete logic chips. If we take a look at the back side here, we can see that there's not really anything special going on aside from just a whole bunch of uh, trace routing, uh, except that the back side actually has a solder mask over all the traces, whereas the front side didn't, which I, I find really interesting that the front side has all of this kind of, I think, beautiful exposed silver coating on the traces there. Now, one interesting thing about this board, and we see this on a few of the other boards as well, are all of the little capacitors that are with each chip here. And those capacitors are actually mounted upside down. So the legs come up and then bend 180 degrees to go down back into the board. I have absolutely no idea why they did this. Uh, so if, if anybody knows why this particular design choice was done, please let me know in the comments. Uh, but other than that, the printer interface card itself is pretty simple. So actually, I'm hoping that it'll work with no issues. All right, next up are the two multiplexer boards. And this one actually has a sticker from Centurion on it with a date on it, which is 111283. So these are actually five years newer than the printer board that we just took a look at. Now, near as I can tell, these two boards are identical with the exception of the crystal oscillator here on this board. It's, it's not populated on this board. And I'm not entirely sure why that is. That seems like a really weird piece to just leave out on one of the boards. Uh, but other than that, they all seem pretty much identical. They all have uh, these four massive chips here. And these are 19-10459-01, uh, COM 2017 UART controller chips. So this has a, a bunch of serial connectors on the end. So this is, I believe, a UART serial control board. The rest of the chips are all 7400 series logic chips. Now all the boards that we've looked at so far have these Sprog axial capacitors. And I seem to remember hearing that Sprog made some really good capacitors. So I don't think I'm gonna replace these unless you guys know better. If you guys know whether Sprog is a reliable capacitor brand or not, uh, definitely let me know in the comments. Now if we take a look at the back of these boards here, uh, we can see that uh, this one is not free of some rework. There's actually a little bodge wire here. If you take a look at the back of the other one, it is bodge wire free. So at some point in time, I am inclined to believe that there was a failure on this board and it required a bodge wire to get going. And it wasn't a initial manufacturing thing, otherwise I think we would see the same bodge wire on this one. So that's the two multiplexer boards. I call them multiplexer boards because the little tab on the front says MUX. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that these are the serial interface boards that connect up to external terminals and things of that sort. So I, I believe that these are gonna generate that uh, 20 milliamp EIA current loop that the terminals are expecting. Uh, but again, I could be totally off the mark. <laughs> I'm making a whole lot of guesses here uh, just based on what I'm looking at. So if you guys know better, definitely let me know. 
All right, next up are the disc controller boards, and surprisingly, these are totally different from each other. Uh, the one on top is just called a disc controller. That's what's actually written on the board here. And then the one on bottom down here is called disc slash auto load. Now, I imagine that one was used for the Hawk drive and the other was used for the Phoenix drive, since we had two separate drives. Looking at the date codes, we can see that the uh, lower one here has a sticker that says 61683. And 1983 seems to be a pretty consistent number that I'm seeing coming up on more and more of the boards. So I'm starting to feel inclined to believe that the computer itself was built in 1983 and they used a lot of new old stock parts here and there. Now the top board up here has a sticker that says date uh, but whatever was printed on it has long since faded out. So I started looking at some of the date codes on the chips and the newest date code was uh, 8037. Um, so it's possible that this is actually an older board than this one, despite the fact that I think it actually looks newer. Now the lower board is by far the more beautiful board because it has this absolutely stunning ceramic programmable read-only memory. This is a MM1702AQ. It is a 256 by 8-bit programmable read-only memory. And it's got this little window on top so you can shine a UV light on it for uh, so many minutes to erase it. Um, but aside from this uh, programmable read-only memory, pretty much every other chip on the board is some form of 7400 series logic chip. If you take a look at the backside of both of the boards here, we can see that they're both free of any bodge wires. Though this lower board, interestingly, has some uh, components, uh, what looks to be bodged in. I don't know if this was done after the fact or if this was part of their manufacturing. Maybe uh, the board design uh, was missing something and they had to put those uh, components in. Um, aside from that, the back of the boards look fairly clean. So those are our two disc controller boards. Both of them are still using these uh, Sprague capacitors. So hopefully I'm not gonna have to replace anything on either of these boards. They'll just get a quick cleanup and I'm hoping everything works just fine. All right, next up are the random access memory boards. And uh, I mean, that's fairly obvious just from looking at them. Anytime you see a massive row of ICs like this, that uh, generally indicates that it's a RAM board. As far as date codes on here, it was a little difficult to find. Just these little Centurion stickers were pretty much all that I had to go by. And this one here is just completely faded out. But this one up here, I could just barely make out. And it said uh, 19th week of 1984. So it's possible that the computer was potentially built in 1984 or it was built in 1983 and they decided to upgrade the memory in 1984. But aside from this uh, massive bank of chips down here, all of these chips up here are again, just uh, standard 7400 series chips. There is one chip that threw me for for a loop and that's this one right here, which is an AM25LS2538PC. This is a 328 decoder demultiplexer. Um, I'm sure that there was a 7400 series equivalent that could have been used, but they chose to use that one. Now that's all just uh, control logic for the RAM itself, which is down here. Now, all of the RAM chips are MCM4116BP15 chips, with the exception of this row right here, which has been changed to MM5290N-2. Regardless though, all the chips are pretty much identical and should be totally interchangeable. They're all 16,384 by one bit DRAM chips. So here's where we're starting to get into that idea that it's a 16 bit system kind of built around an eight bit topology. We can see that each column of RAM here is marked on the bottom M00 to M7 zero so we have eight columns of RAM and then we have nine rows of RAM and this is the same on both boards. Now I'm inclined to think that this ninth row whether it be at the top or the bottom uh, is a parity bit and then the remaining eight rows are the actual RAM itself. 
So 16,000 bits comes out to two kilobytes. And so two kilobytes times eight is 16 kilobytes per column. And then we have eight columns and that comes out to 128 kilobytes of RAM. And then we have two boards which are identical. So we have 256K of RAM in this computer, which is a tiny amount for how massive these boards are. So let's flip the boards over here and take a look at the back side. This top board here doesn't have any bodge wires, but the bottom board here does. It's got these three really long bodge wires that come all the way from the top to the bottom, and then it's got one shorter bodge wire here. Now this part of it is all the control logic for the RAM. So the actual RAM itself doesn't have any bodge wires on it. But with any luck, after we replace these suspect capacitors here and give the board a little bit of a clean, it'll power up with minimal problems. And finally, we have the two most interesting and insanely complex boards out of the whole group. This one here on the bottom is the board marked CPU, and this one on the top is the board marked CMD. But I believe that these boards are very closely related. First things first though, there are date codes on these boards. This one says 1283, this one says 883. Now the two biggest chips on both boards are going to be these two chips right here and these two chips up here. And these are AM2901 ADCs, which are four bit slice cascadable ALU chips. Uh, so I'm thinking that essentially four bits and four bits, we have eight bits here. And then again, we have eight bits here. And so these two boards are working together to give us our 16 bit architecture but there's a lot of pretty dramatic differences between the two. Notably, this board has these two chips here, which are AM2909 APCs, and these are four bit sequencers, which I believe are chips to essentially control the bit slice ALUs up here. But looking at this board, the only thing similar that I could find was this chip right here, which is a N8X02AN, which is a control store sequencer. Uh, I'm thinking that the sequencers are pretty important components for controlling the uh, bit slice portion of our 16 bits here, uh, but we've only got three of them, which is only controlling 12 bits. So maybe the least significant four bits or the most significant four bits don't need one of these controllers. I'm not entirely sure. It seems really weird to only have one of these controllers here. Now below the uh, main AMD chips here, we've got a collection of AMD built programmable read-only memories. These are AM27S191DCs, which are 2048 by eight bit programmable read-only memories. And again, up here we have a collection of PROMs, uh, but they're all built by different manufacturers. But I believe that all of these chips are functionally equivalent to each other. On this board here, we have a few more AMD branded chips here, and all four of these are the same. They are an AM93L422PC, which is a 256 by four bit IMOX RAM. I'm not sure what IMOX stands for, uh, but these are essentially internal random access memory for the CPU. And then on this board up here, we have an AMD chip up here. And then I think we have another equivalent chip to that AMD chip, but it's built by a uh, different manufacturer. The uh, AMD chip is a AM9128-10PC. The one below it is an MK4802N-3. Both of these are 2048 by 8 bit static S RAMs. So these are the internal RAM chips for this board. Other than those large chips, the majority of the chips on the boards are standard 7400 series logic chips. So I believe that the way this is constructed is that we have essentially a 16-bit bit slice ALU going on here with the appropriate sequencing control that's going to control all that. And then we have a row of programmable read-only memories that are going to contain instructions. And then we have onboard uh, random access memory for moving data around. And then everything else is just glue logic to essentially hold all of that together. Now, having said that, there's a lot more going on than I am alluding to. 
because we have these uh, massive connectors on the end here and sticking up here. I'm not really sure what any of these connectors are supposed to go to. And furthermore, this CMD board up here has a 7905C voltage regulator, which I think is a five volt voltage regulator. So it seems weird to me that it would have its own voltage regulator on the board when we have such a beefy five volt rail already available from the power supply. So there's obviously a whole lot more going on here than I'm aware of. Let's flip the boards over and take a look at the backside. Looking at the backside, there's a couple of interesting things to note here. Uh, the first is that this one has a uh, bodge wire here, and this one has a boatload of bodge wires over here. So both boards have seen some rework at some point in time in the past. But the biggest thing that stands out to me are how these PC boards are constructed. All of the boards we've seen up to now have what looks like a standard etching process done to them. But if we look at the traces on this one, they look totally different. They're all laid out in 90 degree angles, and we can see that there's a bunch of traces that go above or below other traces. And so I believe what this type of construction method is called is multi-wire. And so they start with essentially a blank piece of fiberglass, drill all the holes, and then they route out where the first layer of wires are going to go. And then they coat that with an epoxy, and then they put another layer of wires above it. I did some Googling about this, and I found this really excellent PowerPoint about it. I'll put the link to it in the, the description below if you guys want to read more about it. But it seems that you can make incredibly dense PC boards. I mean, they're saying more than two times as dense. This is awesome. And I understand why they did it for this, because if we uh, flip this back over and take a look at the front side here, we can see that it's pretty much just wall to wall ICs. So in order to run all the traces in the appropriate direction without having the board get too excessively large, they had to use this wild construction method. Fantastic for building a dense PCB, but horrible for troubleshooting. Uh, and you can see that if there is a problem, you cannot repair traces. It just requires knowing what you're doing and running bodge wires in the right direction. Unfortunately, I don't have any schematics for these. I don't even have any logic diagram. So hopefully everything on these is working. I need to treat them like they're made out of glass because I can't afford to break anything on these because there's no way that I could ever repair them. But there we go, that is all of the boards that are in the computer of this Centurion mini computer. So Centurion had some proper skill. It's nice to see that they built the heart and soul of this computer themselves. It's very, very cool and very unique. I don't think I'll ever see another computer like this one in my lifetime. But that's all the boards of the computer, which means that's gonna be all for this episode. If you guys have any comments or any insight as to how these boards work, or if I got something completely wrong, please let me know in the comments. I definitely wanna know more about this computer. I love learning about this old technology. But in the meantime, I'm gonna keep uh, pouring over these boards and trying to figure out what goes where. And thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.